There we go. That should have started. Yep. Yep. There we go. Over to you. Smashing. Thank you very much, Kay. Um, thank you for introducing us and for facilitating us. Um, and welcome everybody to this, uh, yeah, the fourth of our participatory autism research uh, symposia. Uh, as Kay mentioned earlier, actually, this emerged very much from the last one and also some, some research that I've been doing with John. Um, John is Dr. John Rimmer. Um, he's, that's the one, <laughs> the one waving. Um, we started doing some research a couple of years ago, actually, looking at um, sort of presentations of autism, really, um, using art. Um, and I've been working at, in lots of ways, really, about um, using metaphor and using creativity as a way of, um, I don't know, making people more aware, I suppose, of, of autism. And what emerged from that was John's interest in art and autism. And he very kindly then has um, introduced us to Grace and Diane, both of whom are artists who are themselves autistic and who work in the field of art, sometimes around autism and sometimes not. Um, but they very kindly have said that they will come and talk to us about the way their autism, if you like, informs their practice as artists. Um, we all of us have many different identities um, you know, our gender identity, our social identity, our work identity, and autism is one identity. And I think it's very interesting how that autistic identity informs um, the creative process as an artist. So I'm very excited about this session. And thank you very much, Grace and Diane, for being here. Thank you. Um, what's going to happen is, I think, uh, John has already talked to each of them and has made a, a short video, um, which I think we're going to play. And then um, there'll be an opportunity at the end of that for the four of us to come back together and discuss what we've seen on the video um, to you know, give us a chance to unpick things a little bit more. But to that end, um, I'm going to pass over to John, who is going to be actually hosting, if you like, this session. So, John, thank you very much. Thanks, Claire. Um, first of all, the recording um, was uh, lasted over an hour. I think it was about an hour and 10 minutes. And I've tried to condense it. Um, I've edited it down to 30 minutes. Uh, hopefully, uh, it'll still make sense. Um, <laughs> it wasn't that easy, I have to say. Um, but there'll be time later on if there's things that you're not sure about um, that you can, you can kind of respond to. So it's it's kind of been just in two, two sections, basically. So there's there's the backstories and how to how um, both Grace and Di got into art, which is really interesting. Um, so there's there's the section there, and then uh, the second section looking at the art and, and uh, both of them talking about the the art that they make and being creatives. Um, so that that's all I need to say really. So Kay, I think you're going to play the, the play the video. Sorry, can I just double check everybody can hear that? Um, um, no, and is it possible to get rid of the restore pages, which is in the top right hand? Thank you. I don't think there was any sound. Try again. No. No. Um, getting towards yes. the age of Excellent. three. Okay. They were... okay, sorry, I'll take that to the beginning. There we go. I was diagnosed with autism at the age of three. Um, but the top, yeah, and um, I think at first I was developing fine with brothers and sisters, and then at a certain age I just stopped. Um, my brothers and sisters were obviously um, getting towards the age of three. They were beginning to crawl, to walk, and I, for some reason, had just stopped. I was very behind in my um, hand coordinations, um, taking in information, you know, um so my mum thought to get me checked in at the doctors and they diagnosed me with autism but at the time there wasn't much no known about the condition so they didn't want to label me with autism um, uh -huh. because in the eyes of society it would mean um i'll be un unemployable in the future 
Crikey. Which sadly, from my experience, is true, but it was sort of hard, the idea for a parent to hear that the kid's future is going to, it's going to be a bit of a bleak one. Mm -hmm. um, so instead, they labelled me with um, global learning delay. Um, and I think further on with my education, I was then diagnosed um, with dyslexia, but I was only really um, had support in dyslexia, not autism. So throughout the years, my mum uh, did a lot of research and did a lot, found lots of coping, um, coping strategies to help me learn how to, um, kind of to develop and nurture my condition, to try and fit in um, ways of calming myself. Um, and sort of see, I saw the world in a completely different way to brothers and sisters. So in a way, I had to try and adjust to how they saw the world or how society did. And I think being high functioning autistic, I could see and experience what it's like being your autistic person, but also how misunderstanding it is from the onlooker. Mm -hmm. So there's sort of a lot of masking and a lot of um, having to hide my identity or my feelings to sort of try and blend in. But the moment I sort of was able to come home, I could finally let my emotions out and be myself. The moment I left my home, I had to be a different person. Di, you, you, you had a different journey, didn't you, really, than that? Yeah, it was, it was quite different. Um, from about the age of five, I'd say, I knew I seemed different to other people in certain ways. Uh, it was hard to put my finger on quite how, but I knew I was doing things differently and other people did things that I found unusual, but that was probably normal to everybody else. Um, and basically from that age, I kind of grew up with really bad, undiagnosed um, anxiety and depression and kind of went through that the whole of my youth. Uh, and I eventually got to an age where I thought enough's enough. I, I kind of want to stay alive. I don't want to feel like this. I don't want these thoughts in my brain all the time. Uh, and I tried to seek help. And, and it was quite difficult, to be honest, because I didn't know what was, for want of a better word, what was wrong with me. I didn't know how to explain it. I didn't understand what was going on. It was really confusing. Um, and yeah, I, I tried a couple of times when I was in my early 20s. Uh, and I remember after going to a doctor, they sent me to some sort of therapist or something. And, and their advice on my final session with them was not what you'd expect, but was to go home that Christmas and probably just to go and get drunk and get laid. And that was that was the medical opinion there. So that was my first go into it. Yeah, mm. uh, it didn't leave me with much confidence to go back again, I must admit. So I carried on struggling for a number more years. Uh, yeah, quite a long, yeah, about another 10 years maybe. Um, when I was 36, I think it was finally, uh, actually, I owe Grace a big thank you for this. I was, I was back in the system again already to try and figure out what was wrong with me. Um, but Grace was, Grace was a student at the university where I was working. And the day she just walked into the room and just walked in front of me, I just said to myself, whatever that kid's got, that's what I've got. And I could just identify it straight away by looking at her mannerisms and how she couldn't look people in the eye, the way she walked, everything. It was like looking at me 20 years ago in a mirror. And anyway, me and Grace had got talking about her work that year. Uh, and she said it was based on autism. And then she opened up and told me she was autistic. And, and I was literally, I was in the system at the time. I was going to see people. Um, I think I'd just gone through cognitive behavioral therapy for something like a third time. It didn't feel like it had really done anything for me. And at the end, the lady just said to me, what would you like to happen next? I'm thinking, you're, you're the medical expert, not me. What, what's my options? And she said, I could put you forward for an, an autism um, test. And first of all, I was a bit like, mm, but I, it was around that time, like I say, when I'd met Grace and, and I just said, yeah, yeah, go for it. And yeah, I went in for that. And, and then I got my, got my results. Yeah, got my, 
Right. But my diagnosis, I think it was age 36, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so quite, quite, quite so different. Quite, quite different to Grace's, yeah. 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 Um, it was basically figuring it out yourself, nobody to help, so. Okay. So, so both of you met at MMU, Manchester Metropolitan University. How, you're, so Grace, could you, you start off and just say something about um, how art became a, a big thing in your life, really? Um, I think it was a, a, a coping mechanism for processing my day as a child. Um, I was sort of brought up as having something that I didn't quite understand until someone pointed out. And I was always sort of felt a bit like an alien um, in education, some members of the family. Um, so I found peace and sort of like a, a comfort in drawing things. It starts off with recording stuff I'd seen on the bus on the way to school um, or drawing what I'd eaten that, that day, you know. Um, and for some reason, apparently, I used to draw a window at the bottom corner of paper. And in that window, there'd be an either a sad or a happy face, depending on how I felt drawing the picture. Uh -huh. And that was the main reason, main method my mum knew how I felt. Because at the age of five, I couldn't speak. Um, I was in mainstream school with my brothers and sisters, but I kept getting pulled behind because I couldn't learn as quickly or um, as advanced as they were. I was, um, the school refused to diagnose me with anything. So um, after that, my mum took me out of that school into a, a, a special needs school at Barton Clough. And from being in there, uh, meeting other people like myself in other conditions, um, sort of small group. I then was taught how to, with repetitive um, language, repetitive creative ways of learning, um, like speech, words, alphabet, um, numbers, I was unable to speak. And then after a few years from that primary school, I was moved to Broomwood. They've taught me as much as they can and I had to move again to a new class at Broomwood Primary School at another special unit. And from there, I then was able to uh, gain more skills, but still not being at the same advanced level as my siblings were, but I was still developing at least. And all through that time, I found um, faith, found faith of therapeutic to just spend my time drawing, sketching, you know, tracing sometimes from books. That was a time and place I could be myself because um, a lot of the time I had to mask in high school. Um, I spent a lot more more time doing art and I became really good at it. Um, and I actually began to express myself more and abstract, became more detailed. It wasn't recording things anymore. It was more expressing emotion or sounds through shapes and patterns and textures. So I was very much trying my hands on different things from textiles, painting, um, scraffitos, you know, lots of different techniques. Uh, jewelry making, um, I had a go at that in my own time. Mm -hmm. um, and the tutors, art tutors noticed my you know, ability and they helped me pursue my creative practice more. And it's my portfolio that I'd gained from um, high school, my art portfolio that got me into college. I never got to college with my grades. So I was always declined because of my English and maths. But um, as much as I tried, I couldn't get the grades. But my art and portfolio, I was getting all high levels. Um, I could communicate it. I could write about it um, as well as making it. And then from college, um, I created, created another portfolio. That's when I began to open up to people. I was able to communicate and feel more I fitted in with other creative people. Um, but at the same time, I didn't really talk much about my condition. I sort of, in a sense, kept it as like a secret. Um, I wasn't ready to open up yet with the way I was treated in the past. And it became just something that just became normal uh, to wear the mask. And then when I sort of went to university, we had, in university, you have a choice um, of doing a project based on yourself or your interests. And I didn't know much about myself because I'd had to hide it from the people. 
around me. So I thought this is probably the best time to actually explore who I am as an autistic person with surrounding peers and seeing what they can see by how I feel. Mm. Um, also to learn about it a bit more myself because I sort of I knew all the bits to get to the part way up to now, but I hadn't researched it enough to actually fully understand it. So whilst looking through work, trans looking at ways of expressing through fragmentation, um, dilemma, um, all the traits, I'd pick up each trait that meant that I could relate to and then put that, I sort of imagined if I had that trait, I could pull it out and I was to take my mask off and look at it, what would it look like? What would it feel? And that's how I sort of understood myself through my artwork and as well meeting Diane and chatting to someone like myself. Di, can you kind of talk us through your kind of um, transition from school and experiences to university? Um, I mean, I, I loved school, uh, but when I, when I left there, it was a bit like, falling off a cliff and going to sixth form college that was a big transition and I kind of really plummeted into depression quite badly then but again like grace for the masking nobody ever knew about it because I just hid it my the toilet was my safe space as well and I'd go in there cry my eyes out as many times as it took that day but then I'd go back out with my mask on and just crack on with my artwork so but um art had been my main thing art and sport from being a little kid always had been and the main thing the teachers always used to comment on to my parents was how good my hand-eye coordination was I didn't really understand that as a kid what that meant nobody bothered to explain it but I can't I understand it now you know I could catch pretty good I could uh, do my sports really well and I, and I was pretty good at detailed drawings and things like that where it turns out other kids weren't quite at that level sort of thing. So, yeah, that was going from school to sixth form was a big jump. Uh, I did all art, art at sixth form. I think I did, what was it, A-level and a GMVQ advanced. So I just literally was able to block out any other subjects by that point. I think I did set PE as well, but they made me... Uh, they made me drop it because it was a bit too much work for me to do. So, uh, but yeah, and then from there, I went on to Loughborough University. Um, and again, that transition, I really struggled with that as well. That was like going to be a grown up and I was still an infant. That was kind of how it felt to me. And, and I used alcohol a lot by that point to kind of get me through things. So, yeah. That was that was another big thing was uh, being drunk quite a lot, which people think that's your personality then, but actually that was me hiding my real personality. So and and giving me courage to be able to do things as well. So, uh, but yeah, and I, I've just been looking through small photos of of work from school, college, and university, and. I didn't really realize, but basically all my work is about me trying to express how I felt and I didn't have a name for it. And that every single piece of work was like that. I was really quite gobsmacked because I hadn't realized till a minute ago. So, um, yeah, that was uh, an earlyish piece at Sixth Farm College that um and I don't think there was too much thinking, to be honest, that was involved in that one. Um, it was kind of pieces that came after that where it's a lot more evident. But I was very much into things like aliens and stuff when I was younger. And I think it was because I, I felt like one. I think that was what my obsession with aliens was probably about. Um, and... I don't know, this sort of looks to be the beginning of me starting to make make aliens and things like that. Although this is Kev the Gargoyle, actually. But yeah, named after my tutor, Kevin okay. Johnson. So <laughs> yeah, this was at Loughborough. This was uh towards the end of my degree. Um and it by that point I was kind of making work um 
based on things that were kind of going on in the world around me at the time. Uh, and it was people were getting different parts of their bodies altered and things like that, you know, boob jobs, nose jobs, everything like that. So there was a there was a piece of work that I made called, I think it was 21st Century Shopping. And it was a fridge that had a load of different body parts in there, but they were all kind of made up just to look like the food that we'd that we'd normally have in our fridge kind of thing. So that particular piece was called armless and legless because it was an elbow joint and a and a foot with the toes removed. So but they're only made of wax, don't panic. So this is a bit closer that, to, to, to what Grace in terms of ceramic work, isn't it? I think. Yeah. I mean, my, my first love with materials has always been clay. It always has been, probably always will be. But uh, this was an early one at university, actually. Um, and I think that's kind of, I forgot the name of this one, actually. But I think that one was trying to show how I felt or what I wish would happen to me or whatever at the time. I wasn't in a very good place in the first year. It was It was really difficult to to readjust to living away from home for the first time and things like that. So yeah, a lot of the work in the first year was more to do with how I was feeling internally. Mm -hmm. And the tutors didn't really like that because I wouldn't explain it. So I was kind of put to the bottom of the class. Yeah, at such a young age as well. I mean, at 18, and when you don't really know what the piece is quite about yourself yet, because you don't know your artistic, so you don't know why you're feeling these things. So yeah, they, I had a real hard time with the tutors in the first year. It was it was really difficult. Uh, I when I left university, I did work experience with the Royal Shakespeare Company and in the props department. Uh, I think I did two weeks there, and then a couple of months later, they gave me a call back, and I ended up working with them for the next five years. It was such an education working there and, and learning from like the best people ever. It was it was amazing. And because I'd been used to using a lot of different materials, so whatever piece I was going to make, I'd always think what materials would suit that. And I'd practice with those and I'd try my best to master them. Of course, I didn't always, but um, and when I went to the RSC, Basically, being a prop maker is making everything look like it's supposed to be the real thing, but actually it's a fake item, so it, it might have to be made lightweight because it's got to be hung from a ceiling. It might have to be made of rubber because it's got to be bashed around an actor's head. So, so it was a case of um, sort of making kind of fake items almost. So, yeah. yeah. I'm, I'm I'm kind of curious how how it was working within a team. How you felt working with other people? It's a very much of a, a team uh, activity, isn't it? Yeah, it was. Uh, we we kind of was all at our own benches, and we all had our own job, which in a way was good because I didn't like people watching me as I worked or anything like that. But then everybody was nearby, so I could always go and ask for help, which is something. I wish I still had now because it, it's just that uh, reassurance that maybe autistic people might need a little bit more than other people. I don't know, but uh, I know I definitely do and did. So, yeah, no, it was and it was good. It was good because it was a good team. Um, it just so happened that I got on with everybody brilliantly there and it was it was amazing. So, yeah, that was a really good experience that that's yeah that's me doing body casting so this is like I don't make a lot of art anymore because I feel like I need a purpose to make it I need somebody saying there's an exhibition I need a reason and I need a deadline whereas I think I still get my kind of fix of art because I get asked to do so many body casts for the students so yeah I think I, I still get to keep my hand in that way kind of thing Mine, as usual, would start as a, as a sculpture, which then miraculously turns into a massive installation. So much to my annoyance and everybody else's. So, yeah, this and it turned out this piece actually was all about autism. But I didn't know I was autistic at the time. 
and this was me kind of showing uh, how things are in, in my brain kind of thing. And some people that I know well, they kind of got that and they came out and they said, is this really what it's like inside your head? And I'm like, mm, yeah, unfortunately it is. So that's just one end of a table there inside a whole um, a whole a whole piece kind of thing. That's just one little snippet. Yeah, of it. I'll try and find the uh, where I am at the moment for these things. Uh, that's kind of the good, ordered, in control end of the table. It was based on the Mad Hatter's Tea Party, oh, okay. this installation. Yeah, um, uh, where are we? There we go. So we've got Stephen Fry in there. Yeah, because I backed the wrong tree, basically. Um, I'd seen a program that Stephen Fry did um, when I still was working for the RSC. Um, and it was all based on bipolar disorder. And I was really convinced that's what I had because all the traits that they had, I had those at the time. Uh, and so this piece was kind of me showing what it was like to be bipolar, but actually it's what it's like to be autistic. <laughs> so. Right, okay. So yes. in, in what sense, or in what way would you say that this kind of could be a representation? Uh, it was showing like on the right side of the table, everything was ordered and neat and in control and as the table went on to the left hand side it gets more messy it gets out of control um and just all the little details that were in there were all there was a little kind of story behind all of them so on the left side of the table on the floor there's ceramic work that's been cut in half on a diamond saw and they put onto the floor and it sort of looked like they're all sinking so they were all it was all representations of how i feel of how, how I am when I'm on a on an upper, when I'm on a lower, that kind of thing, because I was I was very prone to having highs and lows back then. Um, so yeah, and there was a, there was music that went with that. John, I think you helped me with that, if I remember rightly. I think I drove you mad. Yeah, um, yeah. yeah. There was a soundtrack. Uh, there was moving lights. There was, and it was all to give that sense of kind of discombobulation, almost just just kind of messing with your head and not being in control. So, well, normally I kind of, I need a purpose to make. So if somebody says there's an exhibition coming up, that's that's great. And, and I need a deadline as well. That's kind of my main things that I need. Um, and then I can't start and, yeah, I can't start until there's a show to make for because it, because it ends up as an installation. I can't just be making installations at home all the time. There's not enough room. So, um, and then I usually will either come up with an idea of something that's from the news, something that's you know that I'm either struggling with or I don't like the sound of or I think it's bad for society or the environment. Uh, and then I'll always start with a title. And I kind of work the piece around the title. I've always seemed to have started like that. And it can change. It can. It does evolve sometimes. But usually the, the, the title is kind of the starting point of making the work. Mm -hmm. And then I'll do quite a lot of material testing. Because quite early on, I always have an idea of what what something might be made of so then it might not be something I've ever worked with before so material testing usually comes in quite soon for me um yeah and it quite often starts as a singular small sculpture and then it turns into a room full of stuff so yeah. don't seem to be able to stop myself I don't know Okay, thank, thanks very much for that. Grace, do, do, do any of those uh, ideas or processes resonate with you or do you work in a, in a different way? Do you, how, how do you start generating uh, your work? Um, similar in a sense that I start off a title or um, a narrative. And I'd always have like an idea that sort of jolts in my head 
and I'll start off with that, then develop it by, I have to draw it out first. If I don't, I've forgotten it. Um, so I draw it out and as well as, I'll then question it and add things like in, uh, narrative imagery, like what it is it based on fragmentation to express an emotion. I'll look at broken glass, uh, natural forms of erosion and add that to my work, but also adding like a more human element to it as well. Um, a lot of the, as well as having the idea in my head, I'll then explore that through the, the characteristics of the material, um, as well as trying to learn to create things that are neatly refined. I'd also try and put as many imperfections into the work to the point where it's no longer an imperfection. So I'd allow things to crack. I'd allow things, well, purposely make them crack. Um, I would sort of try and make it so I scratch into the form to have like a natural texture. I'm very sensory based. So a lot of the work is very sort of, uh, you can see the hands as well as the eyes. Um, so I do put a lot of detail in um, like textures and added forms, surface detail. Um, I think from a design, um, I think we've got, So I can never just sort of start straight away from just an image or play around the material. I'd always have to have an idea and then explore that idea through different um, other ideas before I can choose one that I'll best want to work with. So it's sort of like, that's quite ooh, mad. So I'll draw like one, I'll pick out one, if with my work, compared to past work, I'll pick out one trait, for example, sensory overload, which is um, the different five senses which are overloaded, or either three senses are overloaded, which stops processing and uh, everyone because they're sensitive to certain surroundings and light. So I'd look at ways of translating that. So hands is a good way of doing it. Usually the person suffering is using the hands to cover their eyes, cover their ears, or take, you know, the mouth. And then I'd use that to express that by re rearranging and exaggerating the fingers on a form using the face or mask as the main canvas to express those uh, narratives. Um, it's very complicated. Um, so I've tried to break up autism as much as I can so that ideally, if someone can relate to one trait of autism. They're one foot in the door of understanding the whole condition. Um, I do love mark making and scoring and splashing colours. Hardest part is um, less is more. Um, I do overload it. Um, you're either up here or down there. You're never in the middle. <laughs> um, but it's trying to translate that for a piece of work without it looking like something that people would fear to look at or yeah. do too much. Okay. Some of my works, people can't actually find, people find too much. Um, so I try and simplify it quite a lot or to make it more symbolic, but still having that emphasis of emotion through exaggerating colours and distorting the forms till the point where you're looking at it, seeing, seeing through the face, that it, it hasn't got a mouth, it hasn't got eyes, it's a mask, but the condition is coming through at its highest rate when a person can't hold it in no more. Um, the idea about having eyes or mouths, it's to express the emotional barrier, but also the misunderstanding that people can't see the condition. And that's the end of the video. It's very abrupt, and I apologise for that. It's my terrible editing. But hopefully you've got a gist of uh, both these creatives' journeys through education and some of the work that they've been making.
It's fantastic. That's the first time I've seen it all the way through. That was really, really fantastic. Thank you. Thank you both, although we seem to have lost Grace. Grace, are you there? Yes. <laughs> Brilliant. That, that was it was wonderful. And thank you, John, for putting it all together. Um it was so nice just sitting, you know, listening to you and and yeah, absolutely great. Um what do you want to do next, John? What what's where do you want to go with this? Well, I was. What I will do first is, uh, if I can do that, is uh, I've just put Grace's um, website in the chat. If anybody wants to chase up some of the work there, um, I advise you to do so. And Grace, you said that you you feel as though you've got statements up there about the how you how you make the work, and you thought that was a good place to go to kind of investigate. So I said again, you sort of disappeared. your website. You 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 I think you were saying that it, it's a good place to where you articulate your kind of journey with yeah yeah. Maybe. It's yeah it's it's become sort of like a reflect on the years of how work's developed, um, what how I can further develop my work, um, and also sort of communicating it where you've got a, a visual. I'm saying my point of what it means, but ideally I want people to take their own experiences um, and opinions on how they relate to the work to better understand it from their perspective. Um, it, it's not all sort of black and white, no. um, but the, tra the, now, the sort of thoughts and processes and feelings making the work was for each trait is definitely sort of something that's come from my own experiences um so it's very much if you were to put each of my work together you've got autism you know each piece together is the condition um and i'm still sort of investigating new work and new um traits and behaviors um to develop onto that mm. it's interesting the, the 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 identity uh and like artists uh try and, and place themselves they don't they don't like being pigeonholed a lot of the time um and i, I was i was kind of thinking that I, I did work myself um i'm a type 1 diabetic and i've done work about diabetes but do a lot of other work as well alongside that that's got nothing to do with it um and then i'm thinking of uh frida carlo who's a, an example of somebody that drew attention to some of her physical um difficulties in terms of, uh, of the body and I'm just wondering for both of you in terms of uh, identifying yourselves whether whether how, how comfortable you are with that um, and it doesn't detract from you being a creative and an artist in that sense or or or, or, or does it I think it's sort of how personal you take it of how you want to be identified. Is, is somebody else wanting to say something? Can't, or is it? No, um, yeah. Yeah. Um, I think it's, it's a lot of stigma with how you sort of use your identity and how people see it, especially with any condition um but body is a great body, body forms and features is a great way to create a can use as a canvas to express um different narratives um because we can all see it and relate to ourselves you know by other forms of bodies um mine using the face mainly is sort of because it was the it's a main vehicle of um where people would see and judge a person by first glance is the face um so that's why i've sort of my work looked a bit obsessed with using um forms of facial features and masks um it'd be interesting to see how other people use other different platforms like diane's used the um the chopped up joints you know it's that was quite that's a very exciting way of expressing even though at the time it wasn't about autism you can sort of see development of the idea of being cut away you know and um exploring that very um as i'll say expressively but with a bit of gore in it as well mm -hmm. um, can, I, can i ask about that because i think that's really interesting actually um dies work 
where you're saying you were expressing autism, but at the time you had kind of mis self diagnosed yourself as being bipolar. So the experience is there before the label, because I think there's a real danger with autism that the label comes first. You go, right, OK, this person is autistic, so therefore everything they do is going to be touched with the autism lens. I, I was interested in that, that you were expressing. I think you said um, it shows how things are in my brain and your brain clearly was autistic, but you didn't know that. So you had, the label wasn't there. And I wondered if that makes a difference. I don't know how actually each of you feel about the label um, and whether it it kind of almost sometimes can detract from the work. What do you think? You've got your own personality and then you've got the condition. You're both you're part of both. It's just um, how, how you see yourself and how you want the world to perceive you, you know, as a person, not just for the condition. Yes. Um, yeah. Agree with that. Di, what do you think? Um, God, I forget the question half a second after you've said it. Sorry. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm, I'm thinking about um, the the labelling, I suppose, the labelling that you're you're expressing something and you're expressing it because you're autistic, because the autism is there. You can't kind of you can't stop being autistic, but you're not necessarily expressing autism, especially when you didn't know that that was the label. I was just going to say, I've not actually made new work since I had my diagnosis. So okay. I, until I make my next show, I can't really answer that question. Um, yeah, but I think it does. I think it definitely will make a difference because it's yeah. something then that you're very much aware of and you've got a name of and things like that. Whereas before, I, I didn't know what I was going through. So. And the the armless and legless piece that you spoke of before, that wasn't that was more social commentary. That that wasn't really to do with autism. That was just yeah. on people modifying themselves. That was all that was. Yeah. yeah. So. I, I think that that modifying yourself is interesting because it's a form of masking, you know, in terms of cosmetic surgery. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. True. <laughs> it's, I was also interested that you said for the your work with the RSC that you were making things that were supposed to be real but were actually fake and that's also a kind of masking isn't it yeah you're creating something that looks like it's really heavy but actually it's made of papier mache or whatever there seems to be a kind of a bit of a theme here between what's what is and what things appear to be yeah very true but i think that was just uh i think that was just a fluke that was just the job that i went for i don't think that's a lovely that. job what a fantastic <laughs> job <laughs> it was at the time yeah it was it was um but yeah that that just led me on my way to understanding materials even you know more than i did before sort of thing but yeah it's it, it's helped with my artwork yeah i liked grace you you say you're putting imperfections into your work until they're not imperfections. And again, is that a kind of, you know, the autism is there. People might see autism as being an imperfection, but actually in time, you can recognise that autism isn't an imperfection. Autism is just a different a different form of perfection. Exactly, yeah. Um, I think people first, I think um, over the years, I only realised I had autism by things people point out as what seemed peculiar or odd. And as you get older and sort of find yourself, you sort of embrace those more because that's your, you know, actual personality that makes you sort of quirky. I hate the word, but it's fun. Uh, quirky and unique and everyone's individual. Um, and the idea of imperfection, it's it depends on how you see it. It's, I think, cracks and distortion and especially erosion is very beautiful. It's very powerful. Um, but that's something that people see as a, a negative thing. Yeah, that is that's that's sort of showing something that seems broken as being strong because it's still attached. You know, it's still holding itself. But the forms that come within it, and you know, the detail, it's become something more. Um, and the idea of sort of putting all these imperfections together, it, I think it sort of creates a piece that it, it's more beautiful than something that's pristine and you know, neat and tidy and um, perfect, you know, what is perfect, you know, I think we have to embrace the things. We <laughs> John's perfect, go stand up. <laughs> well, I was, I, was, I was just about to say uh, that the, um, 
people with aphantasia where you can't um, picture a face or in your mind. So um, when I close my eyes, I can I can picture my daughter, even though she's not there. But um, I know a colleague of mine, a good friend of mine, he can't picture his children, however much he tries. And there was an exhibition uh, with people with aphantasia, artist exhibition, and there was a documentary on it. And it was the case that most of them were asked at the end whether they would like to give up that that uh, condition if you like and and be able to kind of picture things um so to the person they all said no because of the they did they, they found it was it was part of them as part of the way that they uh they'd learned how to how to be very good artists without having to have that imagination picture thing going on in their minds and i thought that was really interesting they just kind of you know we work this way and this is how we do things. I think in what you're saying, what sort of becomes a disadvantage or a, a, a negative, you, you choose how you can then nurture it into a positive. You know, it's or just it a different always way. has to be seen as something that's a bad thing. No, or just the different way of thinking, which um, yeah. actually helps in terms of social life. Yeah. Can I ask, um, there's two questions actually. One is how much you each feel it's your responsibility to, in a sense, explain autism to the neurotypical world. Is that part of your kind of your feeling of responsibility? And also, it's kind of linked to that, do you appreciate each other's work um, because you've got kind of autistic empathy with each other's work and is it is it then part of that that feeling that it doesn't matter if if they out there don't get it we do I'll put that I'll put that to die first <laughs> oh god start on the first bit again <laughs> it was a okay, so how, how much do you think <laughs> would you feel it's your responsibility through your art to explain autism to the neurotypical world well, because because it's still kind of new to me, it's not, you know, I've not known for 10 years, I've not had a name for this. Um, now, yeah, I it, it does sort of feel like a responsibility because I want to be able to help people like me that might have been, might be struggling still and might not have a name for something and maybe I can help them in some way. You know, I, I don't want anybody to go through what I went through growing up. Um, and I just think, yeah, if my artwork can help people, then I'll do anything I can to do that. Yeah, Actually, more than I'll yeah. Grace, what do you feel about this this responsibility? Um, I guess the, I feel responsible in terms of because I've been able to get something that's ideally unseen or only fixated, not fixated, perceived as a misunderstanding. I do sort of feel a bit of responsibility of trying to break that barrier between the onlooker and the person with the condition um, because there's so much sort of um, uh, you are sort of penalised for having it and feel felt shame for having autism without sort of having a choice to change it so you know I've had to adjust to the world around me so much that I, as a young child I did I lost my own identity. I didn't know who I was. I couldn't um, feel relaxed in my own skin in public and with um, ed education people um, to the point where, you know, even to this day, I every time I applied for a job without ticking the box that I've got autism, to this day, I've never got a job interview saying autism compared to saying when I've, when I've got dyslexia. So there's still a misunderstanding of it today um, and I feel like I don't want the next generation of people to have to suffer the same thing that I've had to go through because it's so easy to give up it's so easy to just accept what it is um, from a young child and in high school um, they expected and only um, explained that I, I'd only achieve as far as being a bin 
collector or a trolley pusher <laughs> in a supermarket. Well, Forget well, doing your art, Grace. You've not got the English in maths. Just well, you, get through you, your you education about trolley and do a... It's, yeah. <laughs> it's not easy to get a job as a trolley collector if you're autistic. I can tell you from personal experience of someone I know. So you can get wow. turned down for that because apparently you have to be very flexible to be a trolley collector. I'm not sure you do, but apparently you do. Um, when you found Di, because Di was your tutor, wasn't she? What, and, um, yeah. and, and sort of recognised each other. How was that? And also Di, for you, how was it finding a student? You mentioned that you met Grace and you went, wow, this person's like me. How was how was that experience and, and that experience through your art? For me, uh, meeting Grace was just, well, it's just like you found somebody else off your planet for the first time. It really was. It was just, it was amazing. Um, I had somebody I could talk to. We understood each other. We asked each other questions about things which we've probably not dared ask anybody else before because we might not have known somebody else you know, that's gone through what you're going through or different things like that. Like I said before in the in the in the video, um leaving school and leaving uni and things like that was a really difficult time and I knew Grace was coming up for gonna be graduating and I just thought I don't want her to go through what I went through then. So I was doing what I could to try and give advice to say put this in place do this you know beforehand a year before you're about to leave so you're not really freaked out when it comes to that time because I mean it's scary for anybody but for somebody with autism that kind of uncertainty that that pushed me back into depression quite severely when I when I graduated so yeah I just tried to do whatever I could to help Grace because I knew what was coming up but she didn't because she'd not been through <laughs> that yet so yeah yeah yeah, yeah. And Grace, having having Di as your tutor, how was that? Obviously, you've got to say nice things because she's here. Oh, well, first of all, I wasn't a tutor. I wasn't a tutor. I was a technician. Well, technician. Yeah, technician. Well, you, okay. I just feel like you did taught us a lot as well. So <laughs> you're sort of both. Um, it was it helped me massively because at first I found it awkward to talk about it. Thankfully, I could write it, um, draw it out in a sketchbook and I had some artwork. So I could talk from the book or the stuff I was making. And then Diane wanted to know a bit more. And it's like, no one ever wanted to ask me these questions. Um, or, you know, it, and it was, it, it started off awkward. And then over time, it was actually just, it felt more relaxed. I sort of began to open up more. And it, that in itself sort of helped me explore more of my own work and opening up to showing more of my traits in my work and being more sort of relaxed in myself and how people saw me you know I wasn't afraid to walk around the fidget you know a little fidget thing that would um, help me focus and keep my nerves in order and you know the tips that Diane gave me you know and the warnings it's like oh, okay and saying things and going oh that's actually normal I know normal isn't a term but that is okay just to know it's okay to do these certain things you know to feel like the lights get a bit bright or the unknowing approaching and I've got all the anxiety, I'm getting sweaty, um, I can't focus on anything else, you know, I'm getting jittery, you know, even just a space but waiting for this meeting coming, you know, it's it's that sort of, it's it's coming and it's, you know, it's the preparing yourself for it and then not panic about it. Um, that helped me sort of from things like she's already gained on herself and her own experiences, how she dealt with it not the drinking, but the dealing with it and her own experiences <laughs> helps uh, guide me as well to how I can, um, yeah. from an autistic perspective as well, how I can better have healthier um, habits to dealing with things and clocking and seeing the traits before the breakdown happens which, or the data congestion or the sensory overload. You know, Dan gave me tips on seeing those signs before it happens and the same I'll let down know things that I sort of picked up on the way so we yeah. sort of helped each other it's great I love it John. I think everyone needs an autistic buddy <laughs> yeah absolutely too right I mean that's one of the purposes of this this forum to a certain extent is is giving autistic people voice so that other autistic people can go yeah actually I'm not alone this is this is what it is so yeah thank you both very very much for doing that actually um it's been great John how are we doing how are we doing on time I know we can go a little bit a little bit longer we don't have to stop exactly at three 
Have you got any other questions you'd like to throw in there? Um, oh, well, yeah. I mean, I mean, one of the interesting things is the, the kind of communication issue, that that is sometimes that is a big thing in terms of autism uh, and the kind of breakdown in communications. But what's, what interests me is, I mean, our, the, 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 a lot of art is about communication. It's a different form of communication. But also the fact that both of you have been so eloquent in terms of uh, in here now, but also in the recording in terms of discussing and, and, and talking about stuff. Um, so that was that was that was great. Um, I was just wondering if the, in terms of how you you look at um, the therapeutic idea, which I think came up a few times in terms of making art, which however professional you are um and you know you can you can be as big an artist as as, as there are there, there is there is that thing about the handling of materials and and grace you were talking about the fidget stuff have you got a fidget thing with you there <laughs> i got a few because <laughs> we, uh, we, we didn't see the fidget things in the in the film that's okay so like uh so these as well as a way of making designs but fiddling around with clay, making a shape. If I like it, I'll see about making it bigger. So it's another way of designing, but it's also a nice way to make things that fit comfortably in your hand. Some rough textures, smooth textures, you know, to sort of help um, ha um, suppress, uh, sort of release emotions that you probably can't uh, physically or facially. So you can focus just getting it out um, therapeutically through an object um so it, that's and the way i sort of get people to and i also do it for wearables as well so you can sort of wear and fiddle with it without having to feel you had to hide it but yet you're in control with how you choose to ex get out that anxiety or focus fiddling something's very good for focusing um every autistic person will have their own object either it be something that's sort of like a brush or a bit of ribbon, you know, or something in the pocket. Um, the, a lot of the work, I think, with the sensory, though, that is sort of, I'm very much into my textures. And a part of me wonders whether that's my autistic sort of release. That's why a lot of my work has textures. There could be that going on. Um, but the sort of, my mind's on black now. Um, the, I make work as well for like, sensory bowls so you can sort of functional but you can stroke it and handle it in different ways a person when they come to buy a piece they're getting to close their eyes and feel in a bowl of pocket heads or large piece they're getting to touch it and the work that they can't stop touching the one that doesn't that makes them feel co comfortable that's the piece that they would essentially have um some textures as well different make people feel more uncomfortable so some textures people don't like um, like my sisters don't like raw clay so if they wanted something i would make some pieces with completely full of smooth glaze you know and other people prefer some different forms of movements than others um so i think it's i think that's very much not i think that's sort of something that's sort of more um advertised and seen i think people seeing them in schools those little spinners that's a new one um that hopefully is gonna allow people to be open to that sort of way of um dealing with their um sensory overload or sort of have something to focus on yeah i use a boring pen <laughs> don't click it do you <laughs> <laughs> I've got nothing to click there, but um, I, I will take the top on off and on. You know, it's gonna get oh, that wow. exciting, yeah. <laughs> no, but it's 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 still it's still a sort of um, a a soother, I'd say, yeah. Well, Without I don't it think, being most, sort of standing most, out. Yeah, most most people won't even think about that. But I will, you know, so many people will twiddle around with a pen or or shuffle or just just doodling is one yeah but it's I mean, doodling quietly as well 
it's fun well, that I've sort had, of quiet fiddle so you're not paying attention to yourself um i've had colleagues in meetings where we just do doodling and just kind of watch each other being doodling and uh who's doing the best doodling and <laughs> <laughs> yeah gets you through the day <laughs> it does yeah. brilliant um i think this has been absolutely fantastic i was having a quick look in the chat um which I think Grace and Di, you have got access to that. There was some some really positive comments, some really people really um, sort of affirming what you're saying, agreeing with you, saying you know thank you for articulating what you're saying. Um, yeah, lovely, really, really some really nice stuff in there. Um, I don't know, Kay, whether we can kind of capture that somehow. I know you've got another another sort of poll or something you want us to do. Is that right? Is Kay still there? Yes. Sorry. Yes, yes. I am. I am here. No, <laughs> can't get my camera on, but I am here. I am here. Well, there okay. you are. Um, yes, I've just got one very quick poll to do, um, and then I can capture the um, the, the the chat, um, and and so that Grace and Diane, if they want to, kind of respond yeah. to any of the questions or anything afterwards. Yeah. Then and can then I can I say to could... people just if you want to add add anything to the chat, please do. I mean, you know, that's quite a good way of of communicating. So if you've got anything, other questions or comments now, just just please do chat away in the chat bar. <laughs> please do. We've got one by um, there. Um, sorry, are they guys? Oh. Oh, sorry. Could... Are we finishing off or? Um... I don't mind. I didn't, didn't want to put anybody on the spot to ask answer questions directly. Um, but there is a question just at the bottom, though. It just says, um, if life stress stops you from creating. Mm. Uh, for me, I think it, um, depending on how stressed I am or excited, I would move to different material. Um, clay work, you can't be too stressed at. You're sort of a level. Um, where you've got to be delicate with the clay. You can, I do sort of over wedge it so it does crack if I want to release it. But what I'll do instead, I'll make, I do needle felting or I'll do some sketches with a stick in ink. So I think it's a bit more, I can be a bit more heavy handed with it um, whilst playing music as well to stimulate uh, my thoughts and feelings. Uh, but needle felting, if you don't know what it is, it's literally wool. And a bladed needle, and you constantly stab it until it creates a form. That's something I make at the side um, that I could do where it's I can get. If, if life's getting too hard, I'll do that, or I'll just lose myself away in my designing. Um, that way, when you sort of do something two D, you can just get the world around you. For me, it just disappears, um, and it's just me, me making, and the music in the background. Um, I think it depends on what sort of level it is that I do. Are you have you got any um things that will stop you from creating, Diane? Can you just start the question again, please? Sorry. Um. Uh, Beth, Beth wants to ask, um, is life stresses stopped you from creating? Uh, yeah, it does for me. Um, if the stress is there to start with, it's really difficult to create. But if I'm already in the middle of the artistic process and I know I've got a deadline, I somehow can still pull it out of the bag and force myself to, to do something. But yeah, stress has got in the way of it for like the last 10 years for me. So, yeah. I'll give you a deadline, Di. I told you, I've been asking for one for eight months off you. Tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> okay, lovely. Well, thank you very much. Um, what I'm going to do, I think, is I'm going to stop the recording. Um, if I can remember how to do that. Um, I'm going to stop recording now. <laughs>